Don't flex your muscles. Flex your mind. Watch a word from the Lord. Thursday nights at 9. I did it for science. Folks, I have survived a lot of events while I've been on the air. The city of Danville. Today in Danville, Virginia, we had all of them come at the very same time, and they all inspected our uh, building. They, they ha I have a document here that says uh, that someone complained. The hate of the KKK. You, you're the one promote hate, and so does John Robinson. It's well, not us. Religions. It's not us. Belligerent BTW. So it, it, look, get that out of my face. Get it out of my face. Get it out of my face. Now, sir, you're with the news media network, and you understand what touching the camera. Are you with the and I know what I'm. Network? No one hit me that fool. Don't don't do so it. So you're not with the Christian Podcast Network. I wonder if I can survive a time change. My new time on Sunday night, 9 p.m. Are you going to church only to find a club? Are you tired of looking for the Bible, but only getting Bible? Are you tired of this commercial? <laughs> so am I. Well, these commercials may be old and boring, but the gospel we preach never is. Come study the Bible with the Church of Christ. We're meeting at 250 the Boulevard. Our new times are Sundays at 9 a.m. for Bible study and 10 a.m. for worship, and then Thursday nights at 7 p.m. Come visit with us. We hope to see you there. Folks, I have survived a lot of events while I've been on the air. The city of Danville. Today in Danville, Virginia, we had all of them come at the very same time, and they all inspected our uh, building. They, they ha I have a document here that says uh, that someone complained. The hate of the KKK. You, you're the one promote hate, and so does John Robinson. It's well, not us. Religions. It's not us. Belligerent BTW. <laughs> So it, it, look, get that out of my face. Get it out of my face. Get it out of my face. Now, sir, you're with the news media network, and you understand what's touching the camera. Are you with the and I know what I'm... Network? No one hit me that fool. Don't, don't do so it. So you're not with the Christian Network? I wonder if I can survive a time change. My new time on Sunday night, 9 p.m. The views expressed on this program do not necessarily reflect the views of the station, its employees, or ownership. Well, good evening, everyone. Welcome to Word of the Lord. James over here with you, and uh, we're glad that you stay tuned. I know we had some callers that are on the line. We're going to put the phone numbers up uh, in just a few minutes. We're going to, not going to wait too long to put those up. But we want to first give you our content information, 276-340-2653 is how you can reach me. And uh, uh, that's me personally, a word from the Lord at gmail.com is my email address. If you're in the Eden area, we want you to be sure and drop by and visit us. We had visitors denied at our Bible study. And on 250 the Boulevard, we hope that you will come out and visit with us anytime you have a chance. We really want to see you, and we'd be glad to study the Bible with you. If you're in the Martinsville area, uh, we want you to take advantage of their Bible studies on Sundays and on Wednesdays, 823 Starling Avenue in Martinsville. Brother Johnny Robertson is there. Brother Eugene uh, Edwards is also there. I don't have his number up, but uh, I think it's 806 something or another. We'll... Call, call one of us and we'll get it to you. If you, if you uh, 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 need to know that, uh, 120 American Legion in Danville and uh, Mark is, is there. I uh, sh should actually put Micah's number back up there now. I'm not used to Micah not being here, so I've kind of phased you out, brother, but glad you're back with us in this area. And, uh, you know, friends, we're just the kind of people that would like to see you. Study the Bible with us. The lady called in on the last, uh, last hour. Uh, was glad to... Uh, for us to come out and have a Bible study. Hopefully we'll, that will transpire, take place, and we'll get to uh, study the Bible with someone in the community here in Reedsville. And so we hope that you will take advantage of that uh, anytime you can. Of course, we want to remind you of what does the Bible say, not just on Sunday nights and Thursday, Thursday nights, but also on Tuesday nights on WHIG-TV uh, in uh, 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 Rocky Mount, North Carolina. This is the... Uh, 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 the program that's, that's airing down there, Brother Johnny Robertson is, is down there uh, on Tuesday nights, and so uh, you can watch online, and we hope that you will do that uh, very thing. We're just trying to spread the gospel as much as we can to every place, go into all the world and teach the gospel, as the Bible tells us in Matthew 28, uh, 18 through 20. Friends, tonight I, I want to uh, uh, 
basically tonight we're just going to go through a, uh, uh, a booklet that was hand delivered to us while we were under the tent in Martinsville. Now this booklet, I, I want to kind of set the, set the groundwork for you. This booklet is something that is not, it's not new to us. This man, uh, Mr. Hopkins, has uh, uh, written me countless emails. He's written me countless letters. Uh, I've talked to him in his place of business. I've done TV programs based upon stuff that he said before. And then uh, he even threatened to sue me one time after he uh, was writing me emails and uh, was talking about his doctrine that he's teaching. But then he came and delivered this book uh, to us at the tent and told uh, Johnny that if everybody would, if we'd pass these out and everybody would read them, they wouldn't come back to the tent because they wouldn't, they would no longer, uh, they'd know the truth and they wouldn't uh, become members or they'd leave and leave the, the, the church of Christ. But uh, we're going to let you decide for yourself. I, I, I have so much confidence that this is not truth that I'm, I'm glad to give you excerpts from it on this TV program. And I'm not a worry, I'm not, a, uh, as they say down in the south, I'm not a feared uh, in any uh, in the least, that someone is going to uh, hear these lies and uh, leave the truth. If anything, they would go further from the truth if they did believe these things. So uh, I'm not afraid of this, but there are some interesting things that we want to talk about. And you say, well, James, why, why do you do this? Why even give this guy time? Well, one reason, friends, is because of this. There is a constant, I guess maybe persistent, uh, need for some individuals to try to tear down the truth. And the only thing that could be is because it is the truth. Tonight in our Bible class, we actually discussed the very fact that people uh, you would think would love the truth and they would want to hear the truth. But oftentimes it is the case that when you present the truth, the truth is what people uh, uh, pursue more aggressively to stop. And I think that is the case of what uh, some of the things that were discussed on the last program with Mark and Micah. I didn't get to hear all of the program. As a matter of fact, I didn't get to hear, hear much of it at all. But it seems that if someone is, is uh, promoting uh, something immoral or ungodly, then the community just kind of bows down and says, well, you know, I don't, I don't patronize that. I don't, that's, that's one thing. But when you go to preach the truth and you go to oppose that, with the truth, and all of a sudden, now you're the bad guy. Now all of a sudden, there's you know disparaging remarks being made here, there, and yon, uh, round about, uh, and the people in the religious world are the ones who oftentimes are the biggest uh, opponents, the, the biggest aggressors. Let me just give you uh, uh, some example of that, uh, if I if I could. If you'll notice this in Acts chapter, and this is just something that we covered in class. Acts chapter 24, Acts chapter 24 and verse 1. Notice this. And after five days, Ananias, the high priest, descended with the elders with a certain orator named Tertullus who informed the governor against Paul. Now think about this scenario. Think about who, who the, the, uh, the players are in this particular uh, uh, scene here. Five days, Ananias, the high priest. The high priest of the Jewish system now, we understand this time the Jewish system has no longer been, is in effect. The New Testament is in place. Christ is the high priest. But this man was the, he was the, 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 the top dog, if you will, in the Jewish system. And he, he was the high priest, but yet notice where he is. He's coming together with the governor to inform them against Paul. In other words, the politics of this is what ought to just amaze you. Ananias, the high priest, getting together with the Romans, who the Jews had nothing for the Romans unless they could let the Romans do their dirty work. That's what they did with Jesus, remember? They, they, they took Jesus to Pilate and said, crucify him, crucify him. And, uh, you know, we, we can't do it. You know, it's, it's the holy day. We can't kill him, but you can kill him for us. And so they used the Romans. They teamed up with the Romans when it suited their needs. And you know what? That's what we find today. We find people in the same, uh, in the same scenarios people in the religious world will come against us with as much vim and vigor and hatred and animosity as the secular world does because of what we're saying. That's the truth. Now, what is it about the truth that makes us the, uh, the, uh, in the crosshair, that puts us as the target 
for these folks? Well, friends, it's the very fact that what we are saying gives a, 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 gives a standard, gives a, a, a guideline that actually restrains people and keeps them from doing just whatever they want to do. That's why you, have, you can have the atheists attack us, the people who don't believe in God, with the same fervor as the people who are supposedly on God's side. They'll attack us with the same vim. Now, this is what we're talking about. In Acts, 20, uh, Acts 24, this is where they are. But notice, let's go back a, a chapter. Let's go back to Acts chapter 23 and look at this. Acts chapter 23, Paul is standing before the council. Now, we're going to look at the Ananias, the high priest, and get a picture of Ananias. Ananias, uh, excuse me, Paul is standing before, beholding the council, said, Many brethren, I have uh, lived in all good conscience before God to this day. And the high priest, now notice, Acts 23, verse 2, the high priest Ananias con commit, commanded them that stood by him to smite him on the mouth. The high priest said, Hit Paul. Strike him on the mouth. Friends, this is a religious setting. This is a religious group. Can you believe a, a person in the religious world would want to come to, to, uh, uh, to blows with someone else who is a Pharisee? Look, listen, listen. Ananias has just told his crowd to strike Paul. Paul was a Pharisee at one time. Now, he wasn't a Pharisee now, but, but he was a Pharisee. He was, he was in the midst of these folks. And yet Ananias says, smite this. And Paul said unto him, God shall smite thee, thou whited sepulcher. In other words, you know, Jesus said in Matthew 23 about the scribes and Pharisees of the day. He said, you, are, uh, you, you whited sepulchers, you know, you, you basically the, the graves of men and, and people come and whitewash them and make them all look pretty but inside is full of dead men's bones, you know, corruption and vile. That's what these people are. He said, God will smite thee, thou white sepulcher, because why? Because thou uh, sittest to judge me after the law and commanded uh, me to be smitten contrary to the law. Now, friends, can you imagine the, the, the setting where religious people will come to blows against religious people, but yet dare we, dare we play again and again the video the video testimony, the video witness of guys like Ronnie Andrews telling Micah to get out of, the, get out of my church, I'll run the devil out. Or, t or uh, 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 guys like uh, 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 Calvin uh, Adams down there in Eden saying, you know, if I caught any of my members down there uh, studying about with y'all, I'd shoot them. I mean, why is it that these people are so full of, 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 of violence? On another occasion, the man calls up and says, you know, if, if uh, Mike and Mark could have got shot because our preacher was in a Vietnam vet and, you know, he could have killed y'all, what in the world are we doing? I mean, what is it that makes these people so mad? Friends, it's the truth. It is the truth that gets these people irate. And that is why, and that brings me to Mr. Hopkins, who the author of this, uh, uh, this uh, little... Uh, I don't know, 17, 18 page booklet, if you will, his little exercise in futility of answering us. But I just want to show you, I want to show you how, uh, 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 how caustic it can be when you start to uh, teach the truth and how people will oppose you. Now, this is, just, I'm not going to go through every page of this. I have it numbered here. Let's see, this is, uh, there's 18 pages. 18 pages of this little booklet. <clears throat> but we're going to go through uh, 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 quite a bit of this. We're just going to take our time. We'll get through what we can. But on the first page, let's just show you what, uh, what Mr. Uh, Hopkins says. Now, I hope you can read this. And if not, just scoot up close to your TV. Don't, don't uh, pay attention to what your mom and your dad said. And, and scoot up there close and, and get right up there at the screen so you can see this. But in this statement, he says, this is the first paragraph on this booklet. He says, this is a statement. Denominational churches are not in the Bible. This is a statement often made by the Campbellites who use this to convince their members that their group is the only church in the Bible. The Campbellite churches of Christ today cannot trace their origin back to the first century. The doctrine and practice of these churches was started by Alexander Campbell in the 18th century. Uh, these churches are not like the first church of Christ that are in the Bible, but they are... Uh, but they have convinced convinces their members that they are. 
None of the Church of Christ in America today are mentioned in the Bible. Now, I find that very interesting, friends, because notice, he knows, and we're going to show this, he knows that he has to call the churches in the Bible the churches of Christ. See that? Because he knows that's in the Bible. Now, do you find it interesting at all that he uses such terminology as this? And he says that we are Campbellite churches of Christ. Church of Christ, churches of Christ, because he says we have our origin in Alexander Campbell. But he knows that in the Bible, the church was identified as the church of Christ. So he has to say that. He has to put that in there because notice, <clears throat> in, in a couple of, of uh, uh, paragraphs later, this is what he says. He says, the doctrine of the primitive Baptist churches of Christ. Now, whoa, whoa, wait a minute, friends. Do you see how people twist the scriptures? Now, he said the truth will make you free. That's the, that's the title of his book, The Truth Shall Make You Free. But right on the very first page in the third, in the third paragraph, he immediately uh, introduces <clears throat> the primitive Baptist churches of Christ. And he says the doctrine the primitive Baptist churches of Christ teach is in the Bible. Now, wait a minute. If the doctrine that the primitive Baptist churches of Christ teach is really in the Bible, why are they called primitive Baptist churches? Why would he even identify them as primitive Baptist churches? Now, he says that uh, the, these churches of Christ were called primitive Baptist by other denominations, to say the Baptist church is not in the Bible is a cunning way to deceive the people who belong to the Campbellite churches. Now, wait a minute. Who are we really deceiving? Who's deceiving who here, friends? Are we really deceiving people when we say the primitive Baptist church is not in the Bible? Are we really deceiving people when we say the Baptist church is not in the Bible? And Mr. Hopkins comes out and writes his little booklet and says, well, the primitive Baptist churches are identical to the church in the Bible even though the churches in the Bible are never called primitive Baptist churches. Who's deceiving who, friends? Who is really attacking the truth? You see, when the truth sounds so, so good, when the truth sounds so good, sometimes people who hate the truth have to change it so that they don't have to conform to it. Now, Mr. Hopkins says that the doctrines that we teach, for example, those things like baptism, are uh, 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 the, uh, once the contrary doctrines to once saved, always saved, the fact that we refute that. He says, you know, well, we're, we're, we're lying, we're deceiving. Trickery is what he says. But notice this. He says, those doctrines that we teach are not in the Bible. Then he turns right around and says, the doctrines of the primitive Baptist churches is in the Bible, even though the church in the Bible never called primitive Baptist churches. See, we are simply identifying ourselves as the churches of Christ, the church of Christ. He is the one that gives the, 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 the moniker of Campbellite churches of Christ. And he's the one that wants to distinguish the churches of Christ today that I'm a member of by saying, well, they're really primitive Baptist churches. Those are the ones that are really in the Bible. See, friends, we're not the ones that start giving brand names. We're not the ones that start giving these uh, additional names to describe the church of the New Testament, just called the Church of Christ. If, if what he was saying was true about the Church of Christ, just call it the Church of Christ and say the real Church of Christ in the New Testament teaches X, Y, and Z. But no, instead, friends, he has, to, he has to go on and say, well, actually, they're primitive Baptist churches. Friends, you can't even find a primitive Baptist church in the Bible. The primitive Baptist church may be primitive, but it's not primitive enough. Go all the way back to the New Testament, and you will never find the church in the Bible described as primitive Baptist. Never, ever, 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 ever. Never. Not, not even on your, on your best day could you find that. Now, here is what, here's another interesting statement. Here's another interesting statement. Uh, he says, and I, I didn't have this pulled up, in the last paragraph on the first page, he says, that the churches of Christ, the Campbellite churches of Christ, as he calls them, believe everyone in the whole world is lost except their church members. Well, I have a question. What about Mr. Hopkins? What about Mr. Hopkins? Does he believe that everyone is saved? Does he believe that everyone 
uh, who are not in the primitive Baptist churches of Christ, does he think that they're lost or does he think they're saved? You know what I found, friends? Most of the time, when people accuse us and say, well, y'all think y'all the only ones going to heaven, you know what they really think? They really think they are too. If you really get down to it, they think they are too. Or they will turn around and say, well, the church I'm in is not essential. Well, friends, I don't want to be in a church that's not essential. And so you need, you need to stop and think, well, do you really believe that only the church you're in is going to heaven? And if not, why are you even in that church? Why are you even in that church? So maybe Mr. Hopkins, I doubt Mr. Hopkins is called in. He's more of a, he likes to, to just drive by emails and drop off booklets, I guess. Perhaps, though, perhaps he will call in. I don't know. Uh, now, notice, this is on the second page. This is at the bottom of the second page. He says, I challenge all of the Campbellite ministers. Now, that, he would, that's who he, he's talking to us here. All the Campbellite ministers to show a documented written record of any Church of Christ minister teaching or preaching water, baptism, salvation, before Alexander Campbell and his father, who started the Campbellite Church of Christ. The doctrine these teachers teach came from Alexander Campbell. Well, I deny that. And I would say, I would say to Mr. Uh, Hopkins, uh, you know what, I'm not going to answer that challenge tonight. I certainly could. And I certainly would be glad to. But, you know, friends, when we make a challenge to people, we, we show how confident we are by showing that we're willing to sacrifice something if you can prove us wrong. In other words, we have this $1,000 reward. A $1,000 reward if you can find the primitive Baptist church in the Bible. Mr. Hopkins, I'll tell you what. I'll put the money where my mouth is. A $1,000 if you can find the primitive Baptist church in the New Testament. And when you find the primitive Baptist church in the New Testament, when you find it described as the primitive Baptist church, or when you find the doctrines of the primitive Baptist church in the New Testament, and you can show beyond a shadow of doubt that the church in the New Testament is, is the primitive Baptist church, then you know what? We'll give you that $1,000. So why don't you make that same challenge? Why don't you say $1,000 to any Campbellite preacher who can find someone teaching baptism for the remission of sins before Alexander Campbell. Now, I'm assuming he's going to say not in the Bible, though. Of course, that would be the place we would go is in the Bible. We would find someone teaching it in the Bible. But I guess that's not good enough for him, and I know it's not, friends. You know why? You will be amazed. You'll be astonished. Your jaw will drop when you hear what Mr. Hopkins does in order to try to defend his doctrine. You, you'll be surprised. You'll be surprised. Now, so, so Mr. Hopkins, if you really mean this challenge, if you really are sin, in, sincere about this challenge, if you are sincere about this challenge and you, and you want to, uh, and you're confident in it, just go ahead and put $1,000 up. Go ahead and put $1,000 up and say, you know what? Find someone who was preaching this before Campbell comes along. You know what, friends? I think, I think that, that that's kind of a, uh, just talking in the wind. I think that's just wind blowing to say, I challenge someone to find it. Because, friends, I guarantee you, we'll find more than he can shake a stick at. All right? So, so there's his challenge, his empty challenge, his empty challenge. Now, let's look at this next statement. Friends, this is to show you just how empty, how empty of a challenge it is. All right, we're going to take a phone call. You're on the word from the Lord. Yes, um, to ask you a question about the church you're referring to tonight. Uh-huh. Um, in Luke 6, 13, it says, This was not to make them his apostles, speaking of Jesus, for he had already done that. So my understanding is Jesus had a wife, and her name was Priscilla. And they had children. Who had, a, who, who had a wife? Jesus. Jesus had a wife? Right, in his afterlife, after they had crucified now, him. Now where, now, where are you getting that, ma'am? 
the pamphlet that you had been mailing out, it gave it had some um like some notes in it. Not that you had wrote, but it was typed in the pamphlet. The, and um, that you got from us that said Jesus had a wife in the afterlife. Right. It was on one of the lessons. I don't think so, ma'am. I would. I, I wish you would send that back to us, highlighted, because I. But in, but in Acts two eight, it says the apostles spoke real tongues or languages of real people, even as those who heard that day affirmed, we hear each in our own language, in which we were born. So if what I'm saying is true, then Jesus's kids wasn't wasn't gay or they wasn't into worldly favors, but they were sold into prostitution. Okay, oh, really, which right. was his. Uh, let me, I'm going to stop you there, ma'am. Jesus didn't have any children. Jesus didn't have any children. If he did have, they wouldn't have been gay either. But he didn't have any children. And so I'm not, I'm not really sure where you get information, but that must be something that you've gotten from someone else because you didn't get that from us. I want to say before you hang up, the jury convicted them as runaways and they sent them back home due to world destruction. Ma'am, that, that, that's not the Bible. That's not the Bible, okay? All right, thank you. All right, thank, thank you. All right. I don't know where that came from. That was that's certainly not in any uh, uh, literature that I, that that we're sending out. I know Mark is the one who's sending out that uh, uh, that uh, correspondence course, and nothing in it says anything about Jesus uh, being married and his wife naming Priscilla. Uh, so any, anyway, but just to show you, just to show you now, let's get back to Mr. Hopkins here. Just to show you the extent to which individuals will go in order to oppose the truth. Friends, consider this. This is the next statement. This is on the next page of Mr. Hopkins' booklet. Now he says, The Apostle Paul even had Timothy circumcised because of the Jews. Now, I guess I should give some context here. He says, uh, the Jews, most Jews did not receive Jesus as the Messiah. Even the Jews that believed in Jesus were confused about giving up the ordinance of the law, a law worship. That's true. Some believers wanted to continue circumcision and keeping the Jewish holidays and eating a certain meat or refusing uh, to eat other meat. That's true too. There was much confusion and debate about what was proper in worship to God. Okay, uh, that's not that's not totally inaccurate. But then notice this. He says, even. Uh, he says, even uh, Paul, the Apostle Paul, let me get this over here where we're, uh, the Apostle Paul, uh, the Apostle Paul even had Timothy circumcised because of the Jews. It wasn't because that it was required, but it was because of their influence, there'd be greater influence if Timothy, who they knew his mother was a Jew, uh, if he was circumcised. Okay? Paul said in 1 Corinthians 9, 22, he said, I become all things to all men that I might win some. So this was simply something that was done for expedience in order to win people, but it wasn't because Timothy had to be circumcised. But then notice this. He said, Peter refused to eat with the Gentiles in the presence of the Jews. Well, that's true, but not because he knew or not because he thought that uh, they had to be Jews. It's because he had this idea, he had this desire to be accepted of men. Uh, if you were studying our classes on, on uh, Wednesday night, uh, on the book of Galatians, we're going through all this, the idea that Peter, on a number of occasions, knows, we know for sure that he knew that Jews and Gentiles were equal in the sight of God. But yet, because he loved the praise of men on this occasion and was afraid uh, of those who came down, he, uh, he did, uh, uh, he was hypocritical and withdrew himself. But notice this. He says, Peter even required people to be baptized for the remission of sins, which was instituted by John the Baptist under the old covenant before Jesus was crucified. Now, friends, Mr. Hopkins is making this as if Peter is the one who all of a sudden comes with this idea of being baptized for the remission of sins. But that's not the case. He says, Peter tried to bring the old law covenant ordinance into the new covenant worship. Peter did not understand the baptism for remission of sins ended when Jesus died for the remission of sins. Now, friends, think about this. 
He said Peter did not understand that baptism for the remission of sins ended when Jesus died for the remission of sins. Now, could that be the case, friends? Seriously? We're saying Peter made this big of a mistake, not understanding when something was to end? If that was the case, then why did Peter preach it in, on the day of Pentecost? Notice this. In Acts chapter 2, Acts chapter 2 and verse 38, Peter says, They said, Men and brethren, what shall we do? Peter said to them, Repent and be baptized every one of you in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sins, and you shall receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. So he says, You be baptized for the remission of sins. Now, you know what? That would be the, probably the, the question that most people would ask when they saw this, when they read this. That's the first thing I wrote down in the column, in the column of this uh, art, uh, booklet. Well, why did Peter preach it in Acts 2.38? You know what his answer was? You know what his answer was? His answer is this. His answer is the reason why Peter preached it in Acts 2.38 is because, watch it now, he says, he says, in the following pages is what the Bible teaches about baptism. Please compare with all the script, other scriptures to Acts 2.38 and Mark 16.16. 16. Jesus did not teach water baptism for salvation. That's what Mr. Hopkins says. He says, Jesus did not teach water baptism for salvation. He says, Peter and Mark were wrong. Friends, can you imagine some guy saying, well, Peter didn't know what he was talking about? Mark didn't know what he was talking about? Now, I have to ask you something. Mr. Hopkins, do you believe that the Bible is inspired by the Word of God? Do you believe, 2 Timothy 3, 16 and 17, all scriptures given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for proof, for correction, instruction, and righteousness, that the man of God may be perfect, thoroughly furnished all good work? Do you believe that the Bible is inspired? Do you believe that Peter on the day of Pentecost was filled with the Holy Spirit to speak the words he spoke? Now, friends, if you say yes, Mr. Hopkins, if you say yes, then you have to say that Peter was right. If you say no, then you say Peter's wrong, then you're denying that he was guided by the Holy Spirit to speak what he spoke. Now, friends, can you imagine anybody hating the truth so much that his best argument, his best defense, his first argument against baptism for the remission of sins is to say that Peter was wrong. And he's denying then, he has to deny then that Peter was speaking by inspiration when he wrote that. You want a word from the Lord? Yeah, good evening. Good afternoon, James. Good evening, Rob. Who is Mr. Hopkins? Mr. Hopkins, well... He's a guy that, uh, he, like I said earlier, he, he's written in several times. He's written uh, uh, lengthy emails and so forth to him. And I actually did a program on it, uh, on some of his emails and whatnot. I don't know how long ago it's been. It's probably been uh, six or seven years ago. And uh, uh, I put his picture up on, on, uh, on TV one time, and that's really what got him upset. Um, so... He's a local man? Yeah, he's, he's in Martinsville. He's in Martinsville or Valeria, okay. out, out to war on 58 uh, he, West, I guess. He's a I guess. pastor of a church? No, not not to my knowledge, he's not. Okay, so he, he okay. I thought maybe he was a pastor of a church somewhere. No. He, 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 you if just he was, I suspect he wouldn't tell us. Email and so forth. I'm sorry? I said, you just have communications with him through your email? Uh, basically, I've talked to him face-to-face -face before. I've gone to his, he's got a little shop out on 58, and I've talked to him out there. And uh, um, so, you know, okay. uh, just, I, I don't know. I, you know, I'd like for him to call in and, uh, and have a discussion. If he wants to come on TV and discuss, I, I'd be glad to do that too. But I have a feeling if, if he uh, was a pastor somewhere, he wouldn't tell us. Uh, where it was, or he'd probably be ashamed of anybody to to know where it was. Well, but, that's, uh, that's probably that's, right. You were talking about the truth a few minutes ago. It always makes me think of that movie, A Few Good Men, uh, about uh, where Jack Nicholson says, you yeah. can't handle the truth. Can't handle the truth. And, and that's the way he says it. I forget the way exactly, but he puts a little bit more emphasis on it the right. way he says it. But I have found out myself, most people cannot handle the truth 
about a lot of issues in life. They just reject the truth, you know, anything just about. And you can research and research and research, but they still want, you can prove your case, and they still will not accept. They will right. always reject the truth. For right. some reason or other, I don't know why. But I appreciate your time, and right. thanks for telling me who Mr. Hopkins is. Okay, all right. Thank you. All right. So, now, friends, I, I'm, just, I'm just astounded that someone would just make the statement that Peter was wrong and that Mark was wrong. But you know what, friends? He doesn't do it just once. Now, listen to this. Now, listen to this. He said in 1 Peter 3, 20, he quotes 1 Peter 3, 20, where Peter is writing. Remember, Peter's the wrong, the wrong Peter. Peter the wrong. Peter the wrong apostle. He says, eight souls were saved by water. 1 Peter 3, 21. The like figure went to even baptism doth also now save us. Now, he says, did Noah believe in Christ? Did Noah repent of his sins? Did Noah confess Christ? Was Noah baptized for the remission of sins? Where is the like example? Peter did not understand this example. Peter did not understand this example was wrong. Again, so Peter's writings are wrong. Let's just... I, you know what, uh, Mr. Hopkins, I'm going to bring you a knife and let's just cut First and Second Peter out of the Bible and let's cut all the words of Peter out of the book of Acts. Let's make sure that we don't have anything of Peter in the Bible because it's wrong. Even though it's inspired, or is it inspired? Do you not believe that Peter is inspired? That his writings were inspired? See where this goes, friends? This man's doctrine, he so hates the truth that he wants to say that Peter is wrong and doesn't understand what he's writing. Now, so was Noah baptized? Was Noah, did Noah repent of sins? Friends, that is not the argument that Peter's making. Peter is making the argument about baptism saving as a condition or part of salvation just as Noah was saved by water. Now look at this. Now look at this. He says, what sins did Noah have to receive? Here's the, here's the third paragraph. What sin did Noah have to receive remission from? Where is the example of death, burial, and resurrection? The ark saved Noah, not the flood. The ark saved Noah, not the flood. Friends, he doesn't even read what Peter wrote. Let's put this up here for you to see again. 1 Peter, 1 Peter 3 and verse 20. Peter said, uh, whereas eight souls, look, the, very, the last, the last uh, line here, eight souls were saved by water. He quotes that. Mr. Mr. Hopkins quotes that. Eight souls were saved by water. And then he says, the light figure whereunto baptism doth hold not save, save us. Mr. Hopkins says, well, Noah wasn't saved by water. He was saved by, he was saved by the ark. Well, friends, you have to say Peter was wrong in order to, to keep Peter from being right about baptism. I just cannot comprehend the hatred of the truth so much that someone's going to say, well, you know what? I know a way to get around truth that I'll just say Peter was wrong. You know what? The homosexuals do that all the time. Homosexuals do it all the time. I know that, uh, 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 for example, uh, my, my wife went to, uh, uh, she, she met a friend that she went to high school with uh, many years ago, and she went back home and met the friend, and she was going to talk to him. She found out that he was homosexual. She's going to talk to him about being homosexual. And you know what? After she lays out, you know what, this is, this is not you know, God's plan and so forth, you know what his argument was? His comeback was, I don't believe in God. Well, that's convenient, friends. It's easy not to believe in God if God is going to say something that's contrary to what you want to do. See that? And so here's what Mr. Mr. Hopkins is doing the same thing. And remember, we started out at the very beginning. People in the world will do the same thing as people in religion, or people in religion will do the same as people in the world. Both will start to exclude or excuse or deny that there is any authority in the Bible when it goes contrary to doing what they want to do. So he has to say Peter was wrong. He has to say Peter was wrong. Peter and Mark were wrong. But you know what, friends? He doesn't just say it once. He doesn't just say it once. Notice this. 
He says it twice. He says it twice. He says, uh, he says, where is the light figure? Peter got it wrong just like he did in Acts 2.38. Well, friends, let me ask you a question. In Acts 2.38, if you're a Bible student, you know that Peter was not the only one speaking on that day of Pentecost. If Peter was wrong, what about the other 11? Because the Bible says in Acts 2, Acts 2 and verse 14, the Bible says, But Peter, standing up with the eleven, lifted up his voice and said unto them, Ye men of Judea and all ye that dwell in Jerusalem, be this known to you and hearken to my words. Now they're all speaking, Peter and the eleven, other eleven, are speaking in languages as the Holy Spirit gave them utterance. So whatever Peter's speaking, he's speaking by the authority or the inspiration or the utterance of the Holy Spirit. And Mr. Hopkins has to come along and say, Peter was wrong. Peter didn't know what he was talking about. Peter was just, he was just off his gourd or something. I don't know what he's saying about him. Can you imagine that? Well, what about the other 11? You know, we don't have the other 11's words recorded. You know why? Because they were saying the same thing that Peter was saying. They were saying the same thing that Peter was saying because they were all, the audience was all hearing the same message being spoken in their own respective tongues. And don't you think, don't you think that with 11 other inspired men there, if Peter was going off message, you know, maybe, I don't know, maybe he's like uh, a president, maybe he goes off teleprompter or something, I don't know, if he gets off message, don't you think those other 11 go, whoa, Peter, get back on track here. Wait a minute, that's not what we're talking about. That's wrong, Peter. You don't tell them they need to be repent and be baptized. Remember sin? That's not right. Don't you think they would get them back on track? Eleven of them? But Mr. Hopkins comes along. He now not only has condemned Peter and Mark, he actually has to condemn uh, uh, Andrew, James, John, Philip, Thomas, Matthew, Bartholomew, James, the one they call the last, Simon, Thaddeus, and then Matthias. He, he has to condemn them all because they all had got it wrong. See, what, what links people go to, friends, when they hate the truth? When they hate the truth? I just, I'm just astounded. That right there ought to be enough to make you swallow your false teeth. I can't believe someone would say Peter's inspired and he's wrong. You must not believe the Bible, Mr. Hopkins. You know what, friends? If you don't believe the Bible, then why are you quoting Scripture? Why are you quoting Scripture? You know, I didn't take the time to notice, but I, I'm going to go back through this uh, little booklet, and I'm going to see if, if he ever quotes Peter at all. But you know what? Even if he doesn't quote Peter, he quotes John, and John was there on the day of Pentecost. John was saying the same thing Peter was saying, so John must have been wrong too. And, you know, all of a sudden, here we have, um, uh, on the day of Pentecost, we have, uh, well, we know Mark's wrong, so we know Mark can't be uh, teaching truth, but Matthew, Matthew was there on the day of Pentecost. Was he wrong too? You know, what, what are we going to do about that, Mr. Hopkins? Where do we draw the line? Do we just start Xing out everybody that we say is, is wrong instead of harmonizing the Bible with our doctrine? We just cut the Bible out? All right? So, so what do we do? So what do we do? Uh, you know, Mr. Hopkins reminds me of uh, Martin Luther. Let me give you a little history lesson here. Martin Luther, who was so entrenched in this idea of once saved, uh, saved by faith only, he taught saved by faith only. He added the word only to Romans 3.28. Saved by faith only. All right? So he had to add it there. But then he says about James, because see, James comes along and James says, not saved by faith only. You know what he says about James? Martin Luther said about James, that's a right straw epistle. He didn't like the book of James. You know why? Because it went against his doctrine. And that's the same thing Mr. Hopkins is doing. Mr. Hopkins says, I don't like this book, I don't like this author. Because it goes against what I want to believe is true, so I just had to get rid of the whole book. Well, 
That's the lengths people go to when they're bound by error. Yeah, Mr. Hopkins, you're right. The truth will make you free. If you won't reject it, you won't cut it out with your pen knife. Now, Mr. Hopkins goes on to say, let's, let's look at some other things he says right quick. He says, the Church of Christ preachers are like Philip. This is the next page. He said, the Church of Christ preachers are like Philip. They like Philip. They like to use Philip and the eunuch as an example for baptism. Let's consider this example, Acts 8, 26. And the angel of the Lord spake unto Philip, Arise, go toward the south, which is unto the way that goeth down from Jerusalem unto Gaza, which is desert. We see here that Philip was sent by an angel of the Lord. He did not just go on his own. Well, friends, who's arguing about that? Who's arguing about that? But then he says, then he says, on down here in the middle of the paragraph, notice this statement right here. He says, James Oldfield said the eunuch was baptized for the remission of sins. Now, friends, there's not much he got right in this book. But you know what? This is one thing he did get right. Right here. He got, he got this right. He got this right. He spelled my name right. That's, that's what he got right. He spelled my name right. And I did say the eunuch was baptized for the remission of sins. You know why I said that? No, it's not written in the text in Acts 8. But everywhere they were preaching the gospel, they were preaching baptism for the mission of sins. Acts 2.38. Oh, can't use that one. Sorry about that. Can't use Acts 2.38 because, well, Peter didn't know what he's talking about. Well, what about Acts 3? Well, I can't use Acts 3. Well, Peter's talking in Acts 4. We've got to cut that out too. Acts 5. 5. Peter, Peter's talking in Acts 5 too. Let's cut that out. Boy, what are we going to have left of the Bible after Mr. Hopkins is through with it? See that? See, so we're going to start cutting out all kinds of Bible. Well, Acts, Acts 10, man, we've got to cut Acts 10 out too. Peter's all in Acts 10. and Acts, Peter's in Acts 11 too. We've got to cut it out too. We might as well just cut out the first half of the book of Acts because Mr. Hopkins doesn't like Peter to do any talking because Peter says things that are contrary to what Mr. Hopkins believes. Well... Should we take Mr. Hopkins or Apostle Peter? I'll take Brother Peter as opposed to Mr. Hopkins. But he says, James Ophel says that the unit was baptized for many sins. That's exactly right. You know why? Because in the New Testament, everybody was told to be baptized. What was Philip preaching in Samaria? What was Philip preaching in Samaria? Notice this. In Acts 8 and verse 5, the Bible says Philip went down to the city of Samaria and preached Christ unto them. What did he preach? What does preaching Christ include? Well, whatever it includes, notice this. Whatever it includes, the Bible says that the people with one accord gave heed to those things which Philip spake. All right? They were listening to him. They were listening to him. Now notice this. What happens when they, when they heard? What happens when they heard? Let's come down to verse 11. And uh, verse 11. And when they had regard, uh, let's see, verse, verse uh, 12. But when they believed Philip preaching the things concerning the kingdom of God, now here's preaching Christ. They believed Philip preaching the kingdom of God, the name of Jesus Christ. They were baptized. Friends, why would anybody be baptized? Could it be that Philip said something about mm, you need to be baptized, such as be baptized for the remission of sins? That's what Philip was preaching. I bet he preached the same thing. I bet he preached the same thing to the eunuch as he did to the folks in Samaria. And where was Philip preaching prior to that? Where is Philip preaching prior to that? Well, we find him, we find him in Acts chapter 7. We find him in Acts chapter 7 as one, as, uh, uh, excuse me, Acts chapter uh, 6 as one of the, uh, the seven that were chosen for the ministration. And he was, they were selected by the apostles. The apostles selected uh, Philip, now do you think they'd select someone who was going to teach, uh, teach false doctrine? And who was one of those apostles? Well, yeah, that'd be Peter. Peter was one of those apostles. So, friends, everywhere we go, we've got Peter uh, preaching. Philip is preaching. Do you think he's preaching what he heard Paul, uh, what, what did Peter say? I bet Philip was preaching what he heard Peter say. After all, Peter was an apostle. I suspect Philip believed Peter more than Mr. Hopkins believes Peter. All right? 
So just because the record doesn't state specifically that he was baptized for the remission of sins, everywhere in the book of Acts, they were always commanded to be baptized in order to be saved. Every conversion account includes baptism, Mr. Hopkins. Every one of them. Every one of them includes baptism. Now, listen to what Mr. Hopkins says. Let's try to get one more in here. He says, Colossians 2.12, he said, now this is, uh, this is on uh, the same page. He says, Buried with him in baptism, wherein you are risen with him through the faith of the operation of God, who hath raised him from the dead. This says, now listen to this. This says we are buried with him in baptism. This does not say he is buried with us in baptism. We are in Christ when he was baptized. Listen to that, friends. He says we are in Christ when Christ was baptized. Think about that for a minute, friends. You are in Christ when Christ, Christ was baptized in Matthew chapter 3. Christ was baptized way back at the beginning. And he says we're all in Christ when he was baptized? That's not what the Bible says. That's not what the Bible says. The Bible says in Romans 6, verses 3 and 4, that we are, uh, we are buried with him. Notice this. Know ye not that so many of us as were baptized into Jesus Christ? Paul says we're baptized into Christ. We're baptized into his death. So Paul is telling us specifically in the Romans letter where we are baptized, baptized into Christ. Therefore we are buried with him by baptism into death. That, like as Christ was raised up from the dead, we too should walk in newness of life. For if we have been planted together in the likeness of his death, we shall be also in the likeness of his resurrection. Knowing this, that the old man is crucified with him, that the body of sins might be, uh, might, uh, that should be, uh, might be destroyed, that henceforth we should serve, we should not serve sin. Friends, why does Mr. Hopkins not like to be buried in the waters of baptism? You know, he accuses us of believing in water salvation. Friends, we never said water salvation. Do we teach baptism in water? Yes, we do. For the remission of sin? Yes, we do. Because the Bible teaches that. But it's not water salvation. We don't teach water salvation any more than we would teach faith only salvation see we don't teach baptism only we say baptism is a part of obedience that brings about salvation you're on the word from the Lord how you doing Mr. Ophiel I'm doing fine um, it seems to me I remember that in two different chapters in Acts Paul talks about his conversion and his baptism and the term washing away of sins is used. Mm -hmm. Well, why did Paul do that? Didn't he know that Peter and the other apostles weren't telling the truth when they were talking about being baptized for the remission of sin? Well, one of the things that, that, that Mr. Hopkins would say and uh, is Paul was told to arise and be baptized and wash away his sins. But he says, he, he says in this paragraph that I'm showing up, which I, I don't think that I have it. He says, but Paul didn't tell the jailer to be baptized and wash away his sins. He just told the jailer to believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and thou shalt be saved. But see, he doesn't read the next verse. Acts 16, verse 31. Uh, notice this, Acts 16, verse 31 the jailer said, what must I do to be saved? And they said, believe on the Lord Jesus and thou shalt be saved. But the jailer didn't know who Jesus was. So what did they have to do? They spoke unto him the word of the Lord and to all that were in his house. And what happened? They must have spoke something about baptism because the same hour of the night, straightway, he was baptized. Now, why would someone be baptized immediately? Why would he be baptized immediately after asking a question about what must I do to be saved, unless it was part of unless it was part of the salvation sequence. But he 
he also was baptized straightway after midnight, after an earthquake. Can you imagine coming home when you're supposed to be at work because there's been an earthquake and you sit down and you, you go over this with this gentleman who was a prisoner and your family listens to it. Well, everybody's in the chaos of the earthquake just happening. Right. And you're having a Bible study. And they decide to do this for no reason at all. Yeah. Yeah. That, that sounds like a really um, hilarious pamphlet. I was wondering if I might be able to get a copy. Well, I, he left a whole bunch of them at the tent. I don't know. Uh, you know, uh, they, they may be in the kindling pile by now, but uh, recycle bin. But uh, I, I don't know. There's a, there's a lot more to it. Uh, but yeah, we'll, we'll try to get you a copy of it uh, if you would like. Well, so, thank you. All right, thanks for your call, friends. Let me give you one more. Let me give you one more excerpt from this uh, from this article. Uh, well, it says Matthew twenty six twenty eight. Uh, he says this is uh, Jesus says this is my blood that was shed uh, uh, for many. For the mission of sins. Now listen to what he says about this. And I'm, I'm actually going to try to get two more things in here. Uh, he says, baptism is not for the mission of sins. Jesus shed his blood for the mission of sins. Well, friends, the same phrase, and I know you've seen us do this before. The same phrase that says baptism for the mission of sins is the exact same phrase that Jesus says, shed my blood for the mission of sins. So for whatever reason Jesus shed blood was the same reason that you're baptized. But Mr. Hopkins doesn't like that. He's hydrophobic. He's afraid of, he's afraid of the water. But here's one more challenge. Now, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to leave this, let this challenge be there. This is going to be the last one. Mr. Hopkins says, I challenge you to examine. Now, again, let's put your money where your mouth is. I challenge you to examine all of the scripture references I have given and find just one scripture among them that says, our salvation comes from our efforts or choice. Well, friends, you won't find that in all those references that he's given because he picks and chooses the ones that fit his agenda. But I challenge you, friends, to search all the scriptures in the Bible, including those pesky ones from Peter, and find if, in fact, there are verses that indicate that you do have a choice in your salvation and that you do have something to say. He says... Uh, the Campbellite preachers do not understand salvation. And he says, I have given many scripture references. I challenge you to find just one that teaches we're saved by our own efforts and works. Friends, here's a list of them right here. Peter said in Acts 2, verse 40, save yourselves from this untoward generation. Save yourselves. All right? Save yourselves. Paul said in 1 Timothy 4, verse 16, here's Paul. He says to Timothy, take heed unto thyself to the doctrine for in doing so, you'll save yourself and them that hear you. James 2, verse 48. Uh, just read these right here, folks. Just take, the, write them down, jot them down, and write them. 1 Corinthians 13, uh, 2 Corinthians 13, 5. Examine yourself to see whether you're in the faith. Oh, friends, you mean you can do something about your salvation? Yes, sir. Yes, ma'am, you can. Mr. Hopkins, I'm sad to say that you're confused, but the truth will set you free. If you drop this adoption of men that you're holding on to, and read the Bible, uh, you'll, you'll find that you indeed will be free from sin. Friends, we hope this helped you. If we can help you in any way, assist you in any way, we won't do that very thing. Till next time, thanks for your calls, thanks for your attention. Always ask, what does the Bible say? And you'll always get a word from the Lord. Have a good night. The views expressed on this program do not necessarily reflect the views of the station, its employees, or ownership.